Welcome back. This is Chris, my brother in Christ, Stephen. Welcome. Uh, day today is June 28th, year of our Savior, 2018. Mm -hmm. And the title of this video is Flat Earth Biblical Cosmology, Part 4. Flat Earth Biblical Cosmology, Part 4. Now, we left off about stars. We're learning all about creationism. Biblical creationism, because it allows us to understand the plan of salvation, mm -hmm. it allows us to understand prophecy, it allows us to understand the Bible uh, more intimately. You know why? Because why would we want to neglect the introduction to the Word of God? Mm -hmm. As the Genesis account in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, because right out of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, then you have Genesis 3, and something happens in the Garden of Eden causing the fall. And then we have the first prophecy of Jesus Christ. Very important, ladies and gentlemen. All right. So, moving forward, we're learning about stars. We learned about that there are... There are wandering stars reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Rebellious wandering stars that we use to form our Helios, the sun god of Greek, Helios centric center, and we're third rock from the sun right next to Venus, right? The next to Venus, another name for Venus, according to New Age. Luciferian modern counterfeit Bibles is Morning Star, right? Mm -hmm. Mentioned in Isaiah 14, 12 of your NIV. Complete and utter Satanism, ladies and gentlemen. If you pick yourself up, the Word of God in Isaiah 14, verse 12, the person that rebelled against the Most High is Lucifer, son of the morning. Jesus Christ is Revelation 22, verse 16. He is the bright and morning star. Not Venus, ladies and gentlemen, but that's a part of heliocentric cosmology. Interesting. And Uranus is up there somewhere. Yeah, Uranus. Interesting. All righty. So now we're learning about stars, right? What happened in Revelation 12, what verse 1 and verse 4 okay. revelation 12 12 verse 1 and there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars all right and you said uh nine and we have uh, verse four. Oh, verse four and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. All right. So we see here, we see um, talking about using biblical creationism and cosmology to understand what's going on here, right? We got a great wonder. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head was a crown of 12 stars. And then we see what's going on here in Revelation. We see a war that was in heaven, right? Isn't mm -hmm. that what's going on? A war was in heaven. Yes. And you see Michael fought against the red dragon, right? That old serpent called the dragon, correct? I'm going by memory. And then what happened? It threw a third part of the stars. But if you're running to false science, then you would say, well, suns are, uh, uh, stars are suns, and they're 400 times bigger than the earth, and we got a third of these stars cast down to the earth, which absolutely destroyed the earth because they're 400 times bigger times a third of the host of heaven. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't, folks. So we know that these stars are celestial beings that came down from heaven down to earth. Because remember in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, there is only heaven and earth, correct? And they are connected. That's what it is. So we see here, and they're what? What are they trying to do? They're trying to kill the child that was coming from the woman, mm -hmm. right? Now you have Herod who is an Edomite, right? And he was trying to murder Jesus Christ. And he failed, of course he failed, but what did he do? He murdered the children two years and under. 
trying to destroy Jesus Christ. Right. All right. Why? Why is the red dragon, that old serpent called serpent, right? Garden of Eden. Yeah, that old serpent called the devil, Satan, right? Why? He's trying to kill the Messiah coming in to the world to die for our sins. Right? Right. What were you going to say, my brother? I was going to say, I think it's just a, you said red devil, and I, I was not, I was Red sure. dragon is what red I meant Red dragon, to say. oh, okay. Red dragon is what I meant to say. Okay. Um, so we see what's going on here. So we see the importance of understanding creationism or biblical cosmology. It ties into prophecy. It ties into understanding more intimately the plan of salvation. Now, once again, I'm saying that you accept the free gift for Jesus Christ. That's it. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. So you might have people coming out and saying, yeah, man, they're preaching biblical creationism. They're saying you need to do that to be saved. Well, that's a lie because we never said that. We never will. When we never will, ladies and gentlemen. Also, we're dealing with, we're understanding that God deals with weather as well, right? Job 37 verse 9, it talks about what? In Job 37 verse 10, talking about out of the south comes the whirlwind. The whirlwind, correct? And then we're talking about the breath of God, right? Is also frost. It's fascinating. By the breath of God, frost is given, and the breath of the waters is straightened. How about verse 9? Out of the south cometh the whirlwind, and the cold out of the north. All right, so we see here that God's talking about frost. So God makes a distinction between water, mist, Rain, clouds, mm -hmm. and frost. Isn't the word of God expressive? Well, they're all H2O, so therefore they're all interchangeable. Oh, no. no, they're not, ladies and gentlemen. They're not, ladies and gentlemen. They are distinct. They're, every word of God is important. How about, uh, what are we seeing here? We talk about a thick cloud. What about Job 37, verse 11 and 12? Also, by watering, he wearieth the thick cloud. He scattereth his bright cloud. And it is turned round about by his counsels, that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the world and the earth. The face of the world, folks. Another reference to the face. Mm -hmm. The face of the world, as mentioned in what? Genesis, uh, Genesis 1, verse 2. Uh, also, we have Job 38, 22 and 23 and 24 and 25 hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail which i have reserved against the time of trouble against the day of battle and war <coughs> by what way is the light parted which scattereth the east wind upon the earth who hath divided a water course for the overflowing of waters or a way for the lightning of thunder to cause it to rain on the earth where no man is, on the wilderness wherein there is no man, to satisfy the desolate and waste ground, to cause the bud of the tender herb to spring forth. Isn't hath the amazing? rain a father, or hath he begotten the drops of the dew? Wow, it's fascinating. This is Very. all about creationism, understanding God's creation. Now we have the circle of the earth. I know we talked about this, but we're going we're gonna to review again. We have Isaiah 40, verses 21 to 22, because there seems to be a, a, uh, a lack of understanding or difficulty understanding a difference between a circle and a ball which I find very interesting, noticing the difference. Now in geometry, you have a certain amount of, you have certain math for a circle, and you have certain math for a sphere, but they are different, or a ball. Uh, uh, Isaiah 40, 22, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. And verse 21 says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from, from the, the beginning? beginning right? right? The beginning. Where's the beginning? That's Genesis account. We should be paying attention to the word of God, to creationism. He's saying, you understood from the foundations of the earth. Right. Do you not understand? And they're like, no, man, we don't understand. We read the Bible, but we believe we're on a sphere, and a sphere doesn't have foundation. We have smart people that are telling us that. Right. 
Well, you're not getting your authority through the Word of God, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. That is a problem if you do not believe in flat earth biblical creationism. If you do, praise God, ladies and gentlemen. That is awesome. Now we also see the distinction between Isaiah 22 verse 18 where he says, He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of the Lord's house. So Hebrew... The Hebrew language, new, translated into biblical, modern English, knows the difference between a ball and a circle, as geometry knows the difference between a ball and a circle. Right. But it's amazing that you have theologians that do not know the difference, and pastors that do not know the difference between a ball and a sphere or a circle. Fascinating. So there is a difference. All right, so now we have windows of heaven and fountains of the deep. Isn't this exciting? Genesis 7.11. Genesis 7.11 is showing about this windows heaven and fountains of the deep. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up. And the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Amen. How about Genesis eight verse two? Genesis eight verse two. The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Amen. You got three parts going on here, ladies and gentlemen. The windows of heaven is from the firmament. The firmament has windows or portals that open and then they close. Is it creationism, biblical creationism, fascinating? Mm -hmm. Yes, the firmament, the, the fearful crystal. Yes, it's fascinating. Now, what about Malachi 3, verse 10? Malachi 3, verse 10. And I'm going to read Psalm 78, 23. Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven. Malachi 3.10, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Sounds good. It sounds awesome. Amen. Now, uh, we're also looking about the throne of God. The throne of God is very fascinating. We're going to be talking about stones and things like that that the Bible talks about. Ezekiel 1, 25. Uh, Ezekiel 1, 25 and Ezekiel 1, chapter 1, verse 26. You have that, Stephen? Yep. Okay. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. That is 1, verse 25. All right. So we see here we have a voice from the firmament, right? above the firmament that was over their heads. Remember, he's the most high. Remember that there's always up is up and down is down. A lot of times people go, why do you say that, Chris? Because if you think you're on a ball, mm -hmm. up is not up and down is not down. It depends where you are. Yeah. If you're here, then it's different than if you're here. If you're here, it's different than if you're here. This makes no sense, folks. But when you understand that the voice comes from the firmament, from on the Most High. He is the Most High. And so what does Ezekiel 1, 26 say? And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of appearance of a man above, above upon it. All right, the appearance of a man upon it. So, you know, so now we see a sapphire stone. What's sapphire, right? Is it sapphire blue? Deep purplish blue, yeah. Deep purplish blue. So now we have a sapphire stone, and we see the appearance of the throne. Now you have certain pastors who might say, well, this because I say likeness, this is not describing the throne of God. Just like in, uh, what was it, Daniel? I, I hate to say this again, Shadrach, folks. But, Meshach, and Abednego. Yeah, but this is a great example, folks. If, if you say that likeness of a throne is not describing the throne, then we also should be talking about Daniel 
what are we talking about? Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What's going on there when they were thrown in the fire? Now it says in Daniel 3, Daniel 3 verse 24, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished, and rose up in haste, and spake, and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men, three men, ladies and gentlemen, bound in the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto the king, True, O king, right? And I have Matthew 13, 42. I thought that was interesting. And he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Now, according to pastors, they say, well, the likeness of the throne, that's not really the throne. Just like this guy is in the fire, he's like the Son of God, but he isn't the Son of God. That doesn't make sense, ladies and gentlemen. How can you say that a fourth person entering into a furnace of fire can withstand and not be burned that isn't from God? Right. Um, Matthew 13, 42. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Amen. So this is a reference showing about hellfire that, hey, folks, it's better to be on the Lord's side than on science side, yeah. folks. We don't want to side with science because that's vain and profane babblings in the name of science, falsely so-called. It's science fiction, and it's controlled by Satan and the Luciferian elite. So we're talking about, and now it says the likeness has the appearance of a man upon it. Now, was this a likeness of appearance of man upon it? Some pastors say, well, no, it's not, but it's like it. You know what I'm saying, man? It's like it. Now, what we say about blue? Blue is, it talks about sapphire, talking about the appearance of the throne of God. Blue is beautiful, right? We look up and we see the blue sky. Right. That is significant, ladies and gentlemen. Blue is the color of the sky and see it is often associated with depth and stability. It symbolizes trust, loyalty, wisdom, confidence, intelligence, faith, truth, and heaven slash firmament. Blue is considered beneficial to the mind and body. Blue is the coolest color, the color of the sky, ocean, sleep, twilight. The ancient Egyptian used lapis le, luzi, lo, I forgot how to pronounce that, L-A-P-I-S space L-A-Z-U-L-I. Uh, to represent heaven, blue symbolizes the Virgin Mary. Well, that's interesting. Hmm. A pure blue is the color of inspiration, sincerity, and spirituality. Blue is often the chosen color by conservative people. Blue is a calming color. Dark blue is the color of truth and moderation. A blue iris means your friendship is very important to me. Uh, and it goes on. Blue gemstones to wear to feel calm are blue sapphire and blue topaz. Now, what's interesting is we're talking about, now, when you look at Roman Catholicism, the man of sin, the son of perdition, there are, uh, in, the, in the Bible, it talks about the three colors representing the Levitical priesthood were blue, purple, and red. Now, when you're dealing with Rome, they have purple and they have red, scarlet, but blue is removed because they're not about truth. Right. They're not about loyalty. They're not about trust. They're not about wisdom. They're about deceit and deception, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so we see that the blue light is scattered more than other wavelengths by the gases in the atmosphere. The earth is a plane and therefore the horizon always rises eye level of the observer no, no matter how high one ascends. Under the sea, red and other light with longer wavelengths is absorbed, so white objects appear blue. The deeper you go, the darker the blue becomes. In the open sea, only about 1% of light penetrates to the depth of 20 meters. Blue is the color between violet and green on the optical spectrum of the visual light. Human eyes perceive blue when observing light with a wavelength between 450 and 495 nanometers. Ladies and gentlemen, blues with a higher frequency and thus a shorter wavelength gradually look more violet, 
well those with a lower frequency and a longer wavelength gradually appear more green. Isn't this exciting ladies and gentlemen? Um, then you can mix, uh, these are the three primary colors uh, when you're dealing with red, green, and blue. Blue, so we're talking about the spectrum where we can see. Is it important in God's creation that we have blue skies? Mm -hmm. Yes, blue water. I mean, you can look at water green, but above it will look blue, right. which is probably a refractory reflection off of the firmament, off of that magnificent crystal glass that's stretched out across the skies. Uh, so we see, uh, we see all sorts of stuff going on. How about Ezekiel 1 verse 27? Ezekiel 1 verse 27? 1 verse 27. 27. Yes, we're learning all about the throne of God. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward. I saw as it were the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. And how about verse 28? In the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. Now, it, now it says likeness of the glory of the Lord. So, because it says likeness, that's not really the glory of the Lord, right? According to some pastors, it's like, really, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. this is describing really? the throne of God, and you want to explain it away by your private interpretation? Yeah. Well, have at it, ladies and gentlemen. But I'll tell you what, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of Almighty God when you tamper with His Word. Let the Word speak for itself. If you want to say the likeness of the Son of God, the fourth person that was in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wasn't Jesus Christ, well, that's up to you. But I'll tell you what, that's a lying spirit, ladies and gentlemen. That's not from the Holy Spirit. No, nope, sure isn't. So, Numbers 15.38, what are we seeing here? We're talking about what? Levitical priesthood. We're talking about the priests of Israel. Well, the importance of blue, right? Talking about, do you have Numbers 15.38? Uh, here in a second. All right, I'm going to work on Exodus 24, verse 10. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it was a paved work of a sapphire stone, as and as it were the body of heaven in clearness. So we have underneath God's throne, we have a sapphire stone. Numbers 15, 38. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a rib band of blue. Blue. Blue is very important, ladies and gentlemen. That's why Satan completely removes it from his priesthood today. I'm sure that's by chance. No, it isn't, ladies and gentlemen. Satan is the god of this world, and that's why we have to stand for the word of God and believe what it says. Now, uh, it also says, what about Numbers 15, verse 39? Yeah, I was just fixing to say, And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it, and remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them. And that ye seek not after your own heart and after your own eyes, after which ye use to go a whoring. That so you remember to do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. Amen. So we should be remembering the blue because the blue is what? Reminding us of the Ten Commandments. Well, right. that's interesting. Why is blue reminding us of the Ten Commandments? The blue sky. Blue sky. Yeah. What about Exodus 24, verse 10? Exodus 24, verse 10. Uh, we see here about a sapphire stone, right? In heaven. That's 24, verse 10. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of the, a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. All right. So underneath heaven, we're seeing the sapphire stone. Okay. So could that maybe contribute to uh, the blue skies? 
The blue, a part of God's creation, everything's about water and blue and about truth and veracity. I don't know, but it's definitely something worth looking into, ladies and gentlemen. What about Exodus 28, verse 18? Talking about a sapphire, right? A talking about the blue. And the second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. All right. So we're talking about Aaron, right? Aaron was wearing this... Um, well, I forgot what it's called, but he's wearing something hanging from his neck with different stones representing a breastplate. Thank you. A breastplate, and it's representing the stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. 12 tribes of Israel, and one of them is an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. Exodus 39, verse 11 says, in the second row, an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond, right? A diamond. You know what is interesting, folks? If you're talking about blue, maybe, I don't know, maybe this is a theory that the Ten Commandments were written on sapphire or blue. And for the Israelites to remember that, they put it in their ribbon uh, of the, the, um, oh, the, trim. Yeah. the vestments yeah. of... Levites. It's just a theory, ladies and gentlemen, but maybe we should start to study to show ourselves approved. Maybe we should look into the Word of God because blue is very important to God. It's mentioned in there. So, you know, blue is very important, ladies and gentlemen. So as we're talking about what Ezekiel 10 verse 1, it talks about, Then I looked and behold, in the firmament, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims appeared over them as it were a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Once again, sapphire, firmament, blue as the appearance, the likeness of a throne, likeness of the Son of God, likeness of the glory of God. This is a talking about the throne of God situated above the firmament. Sapphire, very important, ladies and gentlemen. Blue is very important. Fascinating, isn't it? Isn't it fascinating when you get into biblical creationism? God bless you. We'll pick this up when we can. Thank you. Bye.